RNC pledge that all of you signed, agreeing to support the party's nominee. I will be totally pledging my allegiance to the Republican Party. At the end of the day, I'm going to support that person who went through the arena and became the nominee. I will support the Republican nominee, whoever it is. I see no circumstances under which I would tear up that pledge. A shocking concept that an elected official actually does what he said. At the outset of this campaign, I committed I will support the Republican nominee, and I honor my word. Senator Cruz, yes or no, you will support Donald Trump if he's the nominee? Yes, because I gave my word that I would. Governor Kasich, yes or no, would you support Donald Trump as the Republican nominee? I, I will support whoever is the Republican nominee for president. Can you definitively say tonight that you will definitely support the Republican nominee for president, even if it's not you? Even if it's not me? The answer is yes, I will. Yes, you will support the yes, nominee of the party. Yes, I will. you still stand by the pledge to support whoever the nominee, even if it's Donald Trump? Well, a Anderson, as you mentioned, what I said is true. I'm, I'm not in the habit of supporting someone who attacks my wife and attacks my family. I've been disturbed by some of the things that I've seen, and I have to think about what my word and endorsement would mean. Do you, you continue to pledge whoever the Republican to... nominee is? Uh, no, I don't anyway. Look, uh, You don't? I, no, we'll see who it is. Republicans backed away from their promise to back Republicans, and it could lead to a big surprise when they pick a nominee. See why Donald Trump could be betrayed by his own delegates at a contested convention. He'll never get there, uh, because on the second ballot, you've got a lot of uh, double agent delegates. Meanwhile, President Obama is scolding the media for helping Trump. So we'll examine the coverage and the president's claims and show you why he could be off base. Look all those cameras up there. They are terrible people. Plus, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Charlie Ladoff brings us the political dispute from hell. I was toe tagged, everything. Yeah, my parents were notified. They never stopped the paperwork. I had died. A mayor once left for dead tries to save his town. What's up? Welcome to hell. This is Money, Power, and Politics. All right, we'll start with President Obama versus the mainstream media. The president ripped TV news and accused political journalists of pandering to Donald Trump for ratings. But he may be looking at this from the wrong perspective. A job well done is about more than just handing someone a microphone. Obama implied the news media enabled Trump and is responsible for his rise in politics by not asking tough questions or holding him accountable. The electorate would be better served if that happened. It would be better served if billions of dollars in free media came with serious accountability. Trump, as the dominant GOP frontrunner, has dominated news coverage across the nation. According to a New York Times analysis, Trump has received media exposure worth around $2 billion, compared to $746 million for Hillary Clinton. And Obama framed much of that coverage as gossip and fluff, as opposed to the mission of political journalism. But it's to probe and to question and to dig deeper and to demand more. But Donald Trump himself may have some qualms with the president's lecture because, as he sees it, political journalists have been tearing him apart. The press is very, very dishonest, and I think people are wise to the... And while Trump has received a fortune worth of media coverage, much of it has painted him in a negative light. That's a typical case of the press with misinterpretation. They take a half a cent. From his lack of awareness of foreign policy to business bankruptcies to claims he ripped off students at Trump University, reporters have been digging into Trump quite a bit, and Trump does not like it. They're scum. So bad, so illegitimate. They are just terrible. Pretty good percentage is really a terrible group of people. And Trump feeds off of criticism from the news media, just as he does the Republican establishment. Now, if you like the media, give them a big hand. And if you don't, give them a big boo. I had a feeling. So while the president scolds reporters for not being critical enough, ironically, Trump may be doing so well in part because of criticism from the media. President Obama blamed the media for fueling Donald Trump when in fact he may have helped fuel the Trump movement himself. 
I don't want to put the cart before the horse. We don't have a strategy yet. Remember how he struggled to come up with a strategy on ISIS, then struggled to explain it, got kicked around like a soccer ball on Capitol Hill, and came across as aloof in times of crisis? Why can't we take out these bastards? Well, Jim, I just, I just spent uh, the last three questions answering that very question. From golfing after a massacre to doing the tango after a massacre to sharing a limp hand with a dictator of Cuba, by his own admission, Obama is not good at optics. It's not something that, uh, um, that always comes naturally to me, uh, but it matters. And that creates a hunger among Republicans for someone who projects strength and comes across as more animated. And Trump is certainly that. Hey, look at this! Donald Trump! Donald Trump! Donald Trump! Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! And so Obama may have inadvertently enabled Trump. And same goes for the Republican establishment for years of broken promises about reeling in the debt. Wow, and if journalists place. also fueled Trump, they didn't do it by rolling over. They did it by piling on. You got to see this guy. Oh, I don't know what I said. Uh, I don't remember. He's going like, I don't remember. I, oh, maybe that's what I said. Look at that headline. Trump mocks reporter with disability. The New York Times, CNN and others convicted him, though Trump insists he did not know the reporter he was quoting was disabled. So while it may look as if Trump may have mocked a disabled man, Trump is so animated, you could also claim he's mocking ping pong players. Bing, bing, bing. Or people with vertigo. <sighs> Uh, or someone choking on dinner. Uh, uh. Jumping to conclusions and attacks fueled Trump, which is ironic since the president has jumped to conclusions by repeatedly attacking TV news. You know, what's the famous saying about uh, local newscasts, right? If it, if, it, uh, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Well, as Murrow put it, we strive to teach, illuminate, and inspire our community. And a lot of the TV journalists I know take that to heart by shining a light on injustice, corruption, waste in government, and contradictions and hypocrisy in politics. You show crime, stories and you show fires because that's what folks watch. It's all you know, about ratings. That is not what drives people to watch based on research I've seen, but the president just passed judgment on the news with the same type of assumption based cynicism that he blames for polarizing our politics and fueling Donald Trump. Cynicism is a popular choice these days. It's what passes off for wisdom. Of course, the president also attacked the media for overhyping the threat of ISIS, so he could always be confusing the media with his own administration. Oh, this is beyond anything that, that we've seen. We will follow them to the gates of hell. In many different ways, the news media can always do better. But before the president weighs in as a news critic, he may want to take a broader look at the problems in Washington that may be fueling this year of the outsiders in politics. Problems the White House ironically tends to discover by watching the news. No, nobody expected that. That's absolutely correct. You know, the Cold War has been over for 20 years. We, we learn about everything we know about this from what we see in your reports. Uh, we learned about them through uh, the reports. The president did not know about this tactic until he heard about it on uh, through the media. He found out about the news reports. Uh, yesterday on the road. Uh, I first learned about it from the same news reports that I think most people uh, learned about this. Uh, we were not aware of any activity. Since I'm in charge, obviously we screwed it up. Gosh, aren't, doesn't it get you just frustrated? Coming up, see why the chances of a contested Republican convention are going up and why Trump could be tripped up by his own delegates. Right now, the pivotal state in the Republican race appears to be Wisconsin. The winner gets at least 30 delegates. And based on projections from the University of Virginia, that could tip the balance. Assuming the remaining states follow the polls and the trends we've seen so far, the race will play out through June 7th. And if Trump wins Wisconsin on April 5th, it puts him on a path to getting a majority of delegates by the skin of his teeth. But if he loses Wisconsin, the chances of a contested convention rise significantly, and that's what his rivals want. Nobody's going to go to the convention with enough delegates. You need 1,237 delegates to clinch. And right now, Trump has 739, Cruz has 465, and Kasich has 143. John Kasich is already too far behind to clinch before the convention. And Cruz is trying to tear down Trump by claiming that he's unelectable. Nominating Donald Trump would not only elect Hillary Clinton, but it would lose the Senate. It might well lose the House of Representatives. It would lose races up and down the ballot. 
And Cruz has gained steam in Wisconsin while Trump has sputtered. Trump's bungled remarks on abortion and the arrest of his campaign manager have not helped his case. But while Trump is having some problems this week, he could also celebrate one new survey that shows something his critics may not believe. Remember all the pundits who said Trump would surely peak at 20 or 30 percent and all of his rivals who said he could never win the nomination? Donald Trump is not going to be the nominee of this party. Well, an NBC survey found the GOP frontrunner is now closing in on 50 percent. While Trump's likability is tanked among all voters, NBC survey found more Republicans are rallying behind him. It shows 48 percent of Republicans support Donald Trump, and he's up 20 points on Ted Cruz. We simply start winning and winning and winning. OK, Donald, how does one do this? The good news for Cruz is the polls have tightened in the next big state of Wisconsin, and Cruz picked up the endorsement of Wisconsin's governor. God bless Governor Scott Walker. While the electorate in Wisconsin may tend to favor Trump, Walker and the Republican establishment are bearing down on Wisconsin. And while endorsements aren't moving the needle much this year, Walker could nudge it in Cruz's favor. And while the polls were tight heading into this week, the movement has favored Ted Cruz. Coming up, we'll show you how this could trigger mayhem at the Republican convention and how some so-called double agents could deliver a big surprise. Dr. Larry Sabato and Republican strategist Adam Goodman have some interesting predictions. And Charlie LaDuff has a story you may not believe with a small town mayor caught up in hell. When the Republican candidates fight over their wives and tabloid reports of affairs, what more can you say? I mean, Hillary Clinton could be considered a founding member of ISIS. This race is a bruiser on both sides, and Hillary Clinton is trying to look ahead in November, accusing the Republicans of peddling hate. The hot rhetoric and the demagoguery it is not only often offensive, but dangerous. But Hillary Clinton is still caught up in a fight within her own party. She has a strong lead in delegates, but Bernie Sanders just reeled off three wins in a row. And he has a lot of money from small donors who can keep giving to keep him going. The only guy that's really standing up for us, the average person, or even everybody, is Bernie Sanders. So Democrats are still divided, with some drawn to Sanders' call for broader change and others drawn to Clinton's legacy and experience. Hillary is the one that's electable and uh, has the talents that we need. Sanders is clearly in a hole. Based on the current count, he'd have to win 66 percent of the remaining delegates to have a shot at the nomination. But he's banking on the party bigwigs or superdelegates switching their votes to him if he continues to pick up steam. That is what momentum is about. All right, please welcome Republican strategist Adam Goodman, who followed us from Tampa to Cuba, back to Tampa again. <laughs> Thanks Can't again for your you, time. Craig. Let's start with projections. Uh, you see, I'm guessing, Wisconsin going for Bernie Sanders in the Democratic race, Ted Cruz in the Republican race, yes? It certainly looks that way because, uh, you know, Trump just has had a horrible week. Uh, his concern has to be, is this gonna, the beginning of a horrible month? He's got New York, though, right behind Wisconsin. That should play. But in Wisconsin right now, Governor Walker, the Speaker of House, all the, the establishment, they're all behind him. The ads are pummeling them, and he's had a bad week. Um, so, I, But on the other side, I think Sanders is going to score his sixth win out of seven, and he goes into New York not necessarily completely vanquished versus Hillary. Do you see both of these races heading into June? Uh, I think they're going all the way and beyond. Uh, they keep saying that, well, the math doesn't add up for Bernie Sanders. The momentum does. And at some point, the superdelegates who have been somewhat counted uh, in Hillary's corner uh, may start to take a second look at this race. And Hillary has another race she's, uh, she's running at the same time, a race against the FBI. So there are a lot of events to happen, I think, Craig, in April that could dramatically change both races. And in the Republican race, we've had many, including Dr. Larry Sabato at the University of Virginia, saying that if we get an open Republican convention, then Donald Trump may be cooked because his own delegates could betray him. If he does not get to 1,237 on the first ballot, my view is he'll never get there. Uh, because on the second ballot, you've got a lot of uh, double agent delegates who have been placed there by state and local party leaders who are not really for Trump, who are going to be pledged to vote for him for one ballot. And come the second ballot, scram, there was somebody else. I think what we have with an open convention is an open book. Anything can happen. As you know, the rules are only written at the convention, at the beginning of the convention, so that alone could be uh, full of surprises. If Donald Trump, however, gets to a big number, 
and I think the big number is something over 1,100. Denying him the nomination could cause all sorts of repercussions within the party, not that affect not only the presidential election, Craig, this fall, but possibly may transform party politics uh, moving forward. You've got Ted Cruz signing this Rule 40B <laughs> that only he and Donald Trump could be on the ballot because right. they've only only they have won a, an eight states. But wait a minute, even Cruz hasn't gotten there. It says the majority <laughs> of delegates, according to Rule 40B, so even right. he might be cutting out himself at this point. Is there something to that if this goes to a second ballot, might there be just two or three other choices? There could be. And of course, there's, there's a rumor that they might put a whole new name in play before it's all said and done. And that name could become the nominee. Paul Ryan has been often mentioned. I think that would be a very bad move for the party. I don't think it's going to happen. You can't have candidates going for the better part of a year all over America, gaining support, gaining votes, gaining delegates, and not getting the nomination. Adam Goodman, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Coming up, this Vietnam veteran was declared dead, toe-tagged, and left in a pile of body bags. Now he's living in hell and fighting to save his town. Well, we follow the politicians from the campaign trail to the halls of power in Washington, and now we're following them to the gates of hell. Charlie LaDuff has the story of love and hell in a very small place. Hell on Earth is located quite literally between Detroit, Michigan and the Jackson State Penitentiary. It was a cold day in Hades, the off season, but the mayor could still be found shambling around in tasseled loafers and a tweed jacket. Dejected, you see, because his wife had commanded him to sell hell. Not anywhere else on earth but in hell can you actually buy a square inch of where everybody's going to spend some time. I thought the whole town's for sale. Well, you know, $6.66 a square inch, I'll get a hell of a lot more. I would like to s step back from mm -hmm. it, but you're not going to be yeah. doing that, so I need to do what I want to do. Right. So. Does that mean he doesn't have to sell it? No, that means we're going separate ways. 71-year-old <laughs> <laughs> no. John Cologne is asking nearly $1 million for his three-acre theme park. With the secret hope, one suspects, that no one in his right mind would be willing to pay seven figures for a putt-putt golf course, novelty shop, wedding chapel, and post office, zip code 48169, Hell, Michigan. What's up? Welcome to hell. And what am I doing here as a person? Yeah. I'm enjoying every day of my life. And I go, and what I do is to try to make other people enjoy. So you don't get lost, you're in uptown hell now. Right, okay? that's, what, that's midtown in the bar that's closed as downtown. The mayor is one of those souls who by acts of decency and charity make small town America a good place to live. He is a member of the Chamber of Commerce, the community theater, a retired car dealer who sent many people's children to college. But the true reason for Cologne's hell is that the proceeds from the t-shirts and bumper stickers allow him to honor the fallen veterans of Vietnam. Most of his platoon died in an ambush at the Kai Tai River in 1968. And Cologne, you might say, died there too and was resurrected. I rolled off a pile of logs. I said, I could never explain that. I said, I rolled off twice. Well, 30 years later, I find out that I was in a body bag and rolled off a pile of bodies in the morgue twice. And the second time I rolled off, you know, they decided to open the bag. And so you don't and you were ever, I was in the bag, the body bag. Given I was toe tagged, everything. Yeah, my parents were notified. They never stopped the paperwork that I had died. His foundation funded through hell places flowers on the graves of those from the 101st Airborne who died in Vietnam. I still feel responsible for everybody in this picture and to carry on their names or to do something that I can still feel proud of. His goal is to have every single grave adopted of the 58,000 servicemen who were killed in action in Vietnam. We're really not asking for money. We want a pledge from you that you will take care of a, of a veteran's gravesite. Why, if they're gone? That's just the idea. They're to be honored all the time. 
we're here today because of them. He ain't gonna be selling you. And so with his life's work unfinished, Cologne's pals in hell cannot see the mayor hanging it up, padding around in Bermuda shorts, and traveling the country in a silver camper. What the, what the hell is he gonna do? He's doing what he wants to do. What are you, his wife? Do I look like his wife? No, hardly. I'm the one taking care of it and the yard. So it's a lot. But the mayor of hell would do well to remember that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Straighten up and fly right, soldier. Hurry up and sell the house. Sell hell. Sell it all. Because heaven and the grandbabies await you. Okay, like our Facebook page for more stories from Charlie and from all of us. That's Fox 13's Craig Patrick on Facebook. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just search for Craig Patrick's Money, Power, and Politics. Click subscribe and get caught up on prior investigations, long-form stories, interviews, and humor skits that you may have missed. So thank you for watching Money, Power, and Politics, and have a good night.